Uh, welcome, I'm Ettore Giacinto and I'm working on, as a lead developer on Elemental and I'm going to discuss uh, about Elemental today and present it. Um, we are going to have a small introduction and show you what is Elemental and the design of it. Um, then we are going to dig a little bit deeper on ana the anatomy of, of an element um, with a bit of introduction and then we are going to have a look a bit on the details of it. Um, then our focus will be on the cloud uh, nativeness side of it, um, so immutability, um, how we can configure it with cloud init, um, upgrades, and the integration with Kubernetes. Later on, if there is time, I will show you um, also a small demo that I have prepared for you, um, which, with which uh, we show actually the Kubernetes integration. And then we will have Q&A. So, what is actually an element? Um, an element is a bootable container. And by that, I mean, it's a very standard um, in the sense um, as you, an OCI, an OCI container. Um, so you can run that container on bare metal, VMs, and on others also devices like embedded, for example. And um, our uh, goal is to keep everything in one single image. Uh, so why an element? Um, everything is an OCI artifact um, in Elemental. So from the packages uh, that we include uh, inside the container to the container itself, which is delivered um, as a medium for upgrades. Um, and how do you actually build an element? Uh, you do that with the standard tooling, uh, with the tools that you are already uh, familiar with when uh, working with containers. So you have uh, Docker or other engines, which um, we are comfortable with. Um, and uh, the only um, requirement is that we have a part of, of Elemental, uh, that is the CS toolkit, uh, in installed inside um, the container image. So a few words on the design. So it is cloud native first. Um, the derivatives that are built in this way um, are uh, immutable and cloud init first. Uh, that means that any, anything, any configuration um, happens um, through cloud init files. Um, upgrades are delivered via container registries as single installable images, um, which are living in your container registries um, of choice, right? It can be a Docker app or it can be a pri private registry everywhere, right? Um, the content of the, of the container image is actually the system which is booted. So we don't do um, anything specific uh, to the, the image. Um, and that, uh, that brings also um, an, a side uh, nice effect that you can, for example, debug the image with your um, with Docker or um, whatever uh, you are using uh, for dealing with containers. And what we bring um, also on this um, cloud native side uh, is the idea of swappable OS. So the image, um, it's a single image which is running in the system and you can swap it uh, with another one. So what we have uh, is also a fine-grained control uh, of the OS version that are running in multiple clusters. So uh, consider we have a um, um, large fleet of nodes. Um, you have consistent versioning because you are you know that um, if I want an image which is stuck at 1.5, I will have that image deployed across the cluster in a homogeneous way. Um, and that, in that sense, I can also, for example, um, organize in cluster groups, but I, I know that the image which is running, it's that one, okay? And it's the, the only one, there's no, no slow flakes and everything is running at the same version. So uh, on the cloud native side, we trigger upgrades also with Kubernetes and we are going to see that later on. And everything is an OCI artifact from the ground up. So um, we are going to catch uh, back that concept later, but Having everything um, as delivered as an OCI artifact makes the whole thing um, container registry centric. So we have we can store everything in the container registry. We can operate over the container registry with other tools, and, and we are going to see that later on. Um, besides, um, there are, for example, other uh, good aspects of it. So uh, if you consider that we can switch to images uh, during runtime, you can have basically infinite rollbacks because uh, you have all the images in the registry and you can decide, for example, to, um, to upgrade to a specific uh, version. So uh, as I mentioned already, 
Um, this is very tied to um, standard um, container uh, workflow. Um, so uh, the, the container are um, de facto standard uh, images um, that become uh, immutable system, which are bootable. Um, so the framework allows you to upgrade from that image and run that image. Um, for building that image, instead, you can just use um, the standard tooling. So on RCTL, Podman, Builder, whatever you are used to run and comfortable uh, with managed uh, containers. On the other end of the system, so our node, uh, it will just pull that image and apply to the system. So we are going to see uh, later on the layout, how this is going to happen. Um, but keep in mind that when we are talking about upgrades, we are um, talking about images that are going to be rebuilt from scratch. So we are going to have some van vanilla image that is going to build, which is, for example, your OS uh, that you want to install. And then we apply that one um, and we swap that one to the running system. So there is no uh, sta state, um, and the only state which exists is the image that you are swapping into. So consistency, it's another um, design point that we kept um, a lot in mind. So we want to have uh, the same uh, base manifest, which is um, among all the derivatives. So when you are building a container, uh, you have just to keep in mind to install a few things like systemd, uh, Dracut and Grub. So the our uh, solid pieces, um, which we are based, actually it's just Dracut and, and, and Grub. Um, we, you can, for example, build a derivative out of Alpine Linux uh, if you wish, um, and that would um, basically have the same uh, feature set. Um, so by that, then uh, it means that you have a lot of um, way to customize it because it's a standard Docker file that you, we are talking about. So you can just do uh, zipper in something or a pt get something, and um, th that image then becomes bootable. Um, and um, this also um, means that all, all our components that are injected inside the image that you actually are installing during uh, the standard uh, Docker file flow um, are, are, are reusable. Uh, so the toolkit is installed inside uh, the container image and provides the same feature set among derivatives. Uh, you can pinpoint to say uh, to specific version of of the um, components of the toolkit so you can also um be specific um and very um, again no snowflakes right so you if you want you can pinpoint to specific version of the toolkit if you want or you can just take the the latest bits um the toolkit itself then is delivered as a set of standalone um and reusable oci artifacts um those are again tagged uh, and tracked as standard OCI images. And that means that if you want to rebuild part um, of the toolkit and you want to store it, for example, uh, privately in your um, environment, you can do that. Uh, and by having just one registry, you have not only the OS image, but also uh, the, the fundamental parts of the toolkit um, with you in the container registry. And that's allow, uh, again, um, a lot of usage, because if you think all the tooling that um, are built on top of container registries, like uh, security scanner and tools and tools like that, uh, it makes a lot of sense, right? So what can do um, an element environment uh, with the CS toolkit in runtime do? Um, it can upgrade to another container image. Um, it can deploy a system. Uh, from scratch, from an image, uh, it can perform reset or recovery, um, and it can also customize the image during upgrade. So let's say that I want um, to install one um, specific image, but I need some specific kernel modules because this group of machine needs that. Can you do that with an immutable system? Uh, yes, you can do with just toolkit. You, you can actually say during upgrades, I want those packages to be installed on top of the um, container image that it's going to be deployed. And you can do that in a, a state, uh, in a configurable way through um, cloud init files. <clears throat> Besides, um, a, an environment in runtime can also perform an installation from live medium. So if you have a live medium, um, uh, the CS toolkit um, can perform an installation of a derivative from it. Um, and then that's the same mechanism we use uh, when building ISOs. So 
the container image um, can be, for example, of a different system. So let's say that you have uh, different images, uh, like in the image here, we have full OS, bar OS, and some OS. They could be completely different and disjointed. So they can have a different base. Uh, for example, let's say one it's Alpine, um, the other one uh, it's Ubuntu, on the other one it's OpenSUSE. You can perfectly um, do that um, because they, they still have um, a fundamental basis and they behave on the same uh, way. They share a, um, the common layout that we are going to explore a bit um, later on. So the container is booted uh, as it is um, and it encapsulates all the needed component. Uh, with that, I mean uh, the kernel, initRD, um, drivers, whatever. Uh, it is in a, a single image. So what we are putting um, and delivering is kernel, initRMFS, and all the tooling required in order to boot that. Um, so in the same way, it can be pulled locally for inspection. So if we think about, this again, the standard uh, container images tooling, so we can just pull the image, um, do a Docker run locally, uh, run a bunch of commands, and, and see how the environment would have actually um, expected to behave, for example. For specific tasks, it can be still um, a thing. The, the, the concept is here that when we pull the image, we know that the every node is running that exact um, version of it, right? So we don't have any discrepancy there. And again, the same image um, can be used, um, for example, as an installation medium. So it can be used to, uh, to build ISOs, raw images, OVA, cloud, specific um, artifacts. So whatever can be um, a, a way to install um, derivative can also be created from a container by itself. So again, we have one source of truth, which is our container, and we have tooling, which is um, built um, around it. So yeah, again, the, the main point is uh, considering the container registry um, a central uh, aspect of our um, operations. So you have maintenance, um, upgrades, or the bug, development, installation, always coming from a single point. So you have, um, again, container registry as a single source of truth, but it's also an hybrid way to, to access the image for different scopes. So um, development, uh, debugging, also maintenance, right? Because we could, um, let's say, we want to provide a simple hotfix. You can just Docker run the container, apply the hotfix, and commit it as another image. True, it's not really a um, advise you to do that because the, the most common way would be to build a Docker file for it, but doesn't exclude you can do that just for the bugging or exploring, right? And it makes things extremely easy to, to work with when, uh, when it comes to that point. And again, you don't have any more inconsistent, inconsistent states between node because you have a store that keeps track of all the images, old versions, and you are sure you are booting to that one and there is nothing else running on top. So there is no additional software or the, besides the image, right? You can still configure to add additional top additional software on top, but that's provided by, via cloud in it. So you have a single way, uh, configurable way, uh, which you can track um, to, to add those additional pieces. And again, if you, if you think uh, at Docker images and how um they natively plug um into the story of GitOps. so uh, you have usually um a github repository with your docker file and you have for example a continuous integration system that it's monitoring that uh, github repository uh, so it builds an image it pushes it to a container registry this is a very standard <clears throat> and common setup uh when when working with container images so Oh, where we are um, hooking here, it's into a familiar flow uh, that it's well known to everyone because um, this way of building things uh, works everywhere. Uh, it works in CI, it works in Kubernetes, it works in almost every environment that you can think of because it's already widely adopted. So um, we are seeing here um, a bit of shift of paradigm in the sense that we want to um, streamline what, what is the, the, the standard building of containers, but just bootable. So we want to be as close as possible as that. Um, for example, one other approach that um, you could think of is storing um, 
images uh, as OCI artifacts, get, which are not container images that you can run, uh, but can build actually, um, can contain, uh, for example, raw image file that you could put. But we didn't took that direction because that uh, breaks a little bit the assumption that you can run something. So then you, again, you don't have one source of truth, you have two because you have the image that you're putting and then another associated image, that, for example, used for debugging. So again, what we wanted to achieve here is hooking into the standard um, container workflow. So you have your Docker file, you just build that image, you tag it, and you treat it uh, as a standard release <coughs> artifact. So everything is stateless, so you don't have um, to compute any state during upgrade because you are actually pulling, again, a single layer that will be applied and it will be run on, on the machine. So you, you have to Im imagine this uh, upgrade and rollback um, happening like uh, as actually swapping OS. So if I uh, don't know if anybody of you know Ventoy, but Ventoy, for example, it's very um, known to be able to boot um, different ISOs from a USB disk. And if you think it's more or less in the same way, so you have something which is completely static, which is your image and derivative, which is just booted on the node. And you are going just to replace that single bit, which is the OS uh, when the upgrade is uh, coming. There is nothing else happening, uh, no transaction in between packages because it's, again, one single layer um, and there is there is nothing else to upgrade. So now we are going to have a look a little bit on anatomy of the element, um, how we can build it, um, with what are actually the differences with um, the standard um, container image, uh, if you want to say like this, but there is really no difference. We are going to see that uh, very soon. And um, we are going to see also how we can um, handle that in the GitOps environment with Kubernetes later on. So um, yeah, the element is composed by a base image, so you are free um, actually to pick whatever upstream uh, container image you like. So again, you can choose OpenSUSE lib uh, from the um, um, official um, registry and just apply the COS toolkit on top. Um, so again, all the tools that we are needed to boot have to be there. So um, kernel, um, initRD, uh, grab. Um, in, in major of cases, we are actually supporting systemd um, actively. Um, we don't have support for others, but um, you can actually try to, to work around it. And it will it will actually work also with OpenRC, uh, but we don't, um, we don't actively support that. Um, Again, uh, the CS toolkit outside of the image, then it's to use it to uh, build uh, older installation uh, medium. Uh, for example, the ISO, um, ISO for um, live medium, um, cloud images, uh, which are statically um, built, um, and VM images, for example. So you can uh, use Packer uh, to customize um, and, and have um, your specific VM running um, a container image of your choice. So uh, that's actually what's happening uh, when building um, um, element. It is a very simple uh, Docker file. So I'm going to underline just the very um, minimal aspect of it uh, that are making it um, possible to boot um, in the context of Elemental. So um, here, for example, you have a standard from. So I, I'm just, for example, here pulling um, from OpenSUSE lib. Then I, I'm running some um, zipper uh, in call to, to install some packages that I might need. And this is, of course, including, again, kernel, um, dragot, and grab. So this is um, to do on the be on behalf of who is um, actually building uh, a container, which is which uh, one be able to boot. So the toolkit is not doing that. It's not interfering that um, that aspect of it. Um, later on, uh, we actually install um, the toolkit uh, with Luet. Um, Luet is just, um, I'm not going to go into the details of Luet itself, but what it's doing uh, is pulling uh, parts of our toolkit from OCI uh, registry. So we have um, the, the component that are making part of the toolkit, which are provided as Docker images. So while we are building um, Docker image, we are pulling also from other 
uh, container Im images, and we are assembling uh, our fi final image at the end of it. <clears throat> so afterward, we um, we pull uh, the toolkit. We can add other custom logic. So, for example, um, we can ca um, customize how uh, it will behave uh, during upgrades by default, or what are the default users, because we could stop directly um, embedded users, or um, for example, SSH keys, or whatever we want to the container Im image. So we can have to perceive that um, the image can be also look at that like a way to um, to build an embedded system where you actually have um, your Credential, uh, let's put it in this way, because I, I really want an image with uh, my credential with it, right? Um, or, for example, you can um, install, yeah, again, other packages and um, branding. So we have also a way um, to customize that aspect of the um, of the image, which is the branding. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but it will happen later in this stage. So, for example, if you want. Uh, to customize the group menu entry, you will do it in this stage. So how actually um, would look um, a system when being puted? Uh, what we have is an active passy layout, and we have also a recovery, a uh, special recovery uh, system. <clears throat> what we actually have is um, three partition only. One, it's the CIS state, um, which is the state partition, which will contain the images that are going to be booted. Okay, so we uh, we are going to store the images in the image uh, file format, um, and we are just, um, for example, during upgrades, we are creating a new image, which will be the transition image that will replace the active system uh, later on, and then we are flagging uh, the old, which is the current system where we are upgrading, as a passive one. Uh, in the same way, we provide the recovery, which can be an image file or a SCOSHFS. Here, the difference is um, SCOSHFS, it's um, completely mutable on that aspect, while the image file can be mounted, for example, and you can write over it. Okay, But while the system is booting, as by default, it's booted in immutable mode. So we have um, the rootfs immutable, uh, US, uh, USR uh, read only, etc uh, ephemeral. Although you can customize some aspects of it and, for example, point to specific paths to not be mutable uh, and, for example, be read only. Or you can, for example, even say um, some paths have uh, stored um, state. So uh, they are actually mutable uh, in the sense that um, you have a base which is coming from the image that you just upgraded. And later on, um, you have um, a layout which is overlay FS mounted and um, all the changes are stored in the, in the CS state partition. So it can uh, persist reboot if you want. So you have also a very specific fine grade mechanism to decide which parts are immutable or not. And the differences are stored actually in, in the CS state, um, sorry, the, CS, uh, the persistent partition. The CS state is immutable and just contains the images that we um, download. The persistent partition, uh, indeed, is the only one which is right. Uh, which is writable by the system, and it is mounted by default to US, uh, USR local. Um, so the, the content which we place here, it persists uh, reboots uh, as normal, and it can be used, for example, to overlay mount uh, some uh, things that we want to keep during runtime, right? Um, so um, again, we have um, persistent partition um, to store the data. The state partition, um, it is just storing the images apps plain image file and contains also the group uh, configuration in some cases. And we have the OM partition, which is uh, just uh, exclusive uh, for cloud init configuration files. So it is um, a mechanism uh, that we have um, to um, put configuration file as in form of cloud init can be multiple of them um, in a specific partition. We're going to see that this, for example, is very uh, extremely useful uh, in a recovery situation where we can uh, just configure things via the OM partition, which is dramatically easy to, to work on. The recovery, uh, instead, it's um, our, always um, booting, for example, an image that you can pick. So you can, for, for example, say my recovery image is OS at version uh, 2.3, uh, but still that um, runs in a different context. So uh, it is always um, not writable by default. 
um, it, it is protected and uh, used in a different way, so you can use it uh, as a recovery medium um, in most of the um, situation where things are going wrong. So what I wanted to show here is we have um, different context for the same image. So we uh, start from the container building. So we just build the image as usual with Docker build. And that container image then can be used by the CS toolkit that converts that, um, that image to um, a format that um, can be used as an installation medium. So you can have uh, ISO, um, cloud images, VMs, and then the booting environments can again upgrade to those images that you still build with Docker build or um, whatever is the tool of your choice. So um, again, everything is um, very circular in the sense that they, uh, also a derivative can be used again as a base. So you can uh, stack different um, elements uh, together um, to, to, to form a new derivative, um, basically. So um, you can have um a base uh, version of um of a container image which is supposed to provide some basic functionality on boot which is actually uh what are our um release artifacts um as cos so if you go to the cos github page you go to releases um you will see we we, we ship some isos vm images and those are just uh, vanilla images that you can use in the context of switching off because uh, right off boot you can just preload, for example, a cloud init configuration file, which will deploy another container image. Or you can use the same artifact with Packer to build a um, um, golden Im image for a new derivative. So um, again, you can use the container um, just as a runtime framework for containers. Um, you don't need, um, it's not meant to, to be used um, directly uh, as a distro. So we are going to, to talk about the cloud native aspect um, of COS now. So how we are going to apply some uh, configuration. Um, maybe some of you might be familiar with the cloud init concept. And we are going to see how we support the, the standard cloud uh, init syntax, but with a little bit of extension and augmentation from our side. So if you if you are familiar with cloud init, you it is a, a YAML file that um, you can provide as an input for configuration to a machine um, to configure it. For example, you can say, uh, okay, I want my user to have these uh, particular SSH keys, or I want to have those files uh, on running on the system. So it is a mechanism to, um, to configure the machine on during runtime once. Um, and in our um, in our context, we do so support the standard uh, cloud in uh, syntax. So if you are familiar with um, with the tool in Python, it, it is um, very um, friendly in that way. Although we don't support um, all um, completely the, the all the statement, all the syntax of, of cloud in it, we do support a very large portion of it, which is. Um, well, uh, it, it is base, um, basic enough to, to cover um, almost all the needed cases. Um, we augmented it uh, with the support to stages. So um, the st in a standard world cloud in it, it works on boot. So you can apply a set, uh, well, a configuration YAML file um, during boot. In our case, we, are, um, we can apply multiple cloud init files in multiple stages. So. The stages actually can be emitted also in runtime. So, for example, I can have um, a service which is emitting a stage, um, or for example, we run a stage during Intram FS. So that allows you um, to configure uh, things um, during the Intram FS, MFS logic uh, loading stage. So you don't um, always um, have to. Uh, for example, let's put you want to create a dynamic system D service. Uh, you can do that and then enable it during initram fs so cloud init in that sense becomes a very um, handy tool because um, you can apply it on different uh, situations so you can have a cloud init um, file running on boot or um, some part of it running when network is up or some parts of it running uh, during upgrades so this is what we did here 
So we split that functionality in multiple parts that you can actually leverage in different contexts. So this is the same mechanism we use, for example, to apply uh, customization during upgrades. So we, uh, you can provide multiple cloud init files that can tell um, to apply different changes to the image during upgrades. And yes, so the the cloud most important cloud um, native aspect of it it's the integration with Kubernetes. So each derivative basically uh, gets support to the system upgrade controller. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it is a um, tool built by uh, by Rancher, which is um, taking care of upgrades uh, of um, nodes in your cluster. And what we provide uh, as a toolkit is um, the integration to it. So um, every uh, derivative then becomes um, upgradable um, in the Kubernetes context with system upgrade controller. And that actually is more or less how it looks like on the right. So you, uh, we will have in Kubernetes a resource uh, representing um, an upgrade. Um, and that's very cool because you can tell to Kubernetes, yeah, hey, I want to upgrade to this image, uh, this version uh, in this way. Um, and that allows you to have um, also a lot of other integrations. Um, for example, um, you can have uh, drain and cordon uh, rules uh, before running upgrades. You can define parallelism. So uh, this is something that we are going to see later in the demo, but you can define, for example, multiple um, upgrades of nodes running in parallel. Um, uh, or, for example, if you know a bit about Kubernetes and if you think about admission controls, uh, you can go um, a lot further with it because then you can have, for example, um, an admission controller just for uh, making sure the images which are being pulled are signed. Uh, with SIGSTOR, um, you can have security scanning automatically happening and gating your upgrades. So you can have um, a lot of things. Um, it opens a lot of things uh, in, in the integration aspect of Kubernetes because um, we, we will see that in the demo. Um, when it will run inside the cluster, it, it will run uh, as a pod. So it will the image will be just pulled um, by the pod. And uh, as um, by re relying compli completely on the Kubernetes um, tooling there. So we are not doing anything uh, specific. And again, this is um, how the, the GitOps flow um, comes together, because we have on one side the building aspect, which is uh, the standard way how we build images that we have already talked about. So uh, we have a GitHub repository with Docker file. I push to it. Um, continuous integration server, it's actually um, watching it, or there is a webhook, doesn't really matter. But the build happens. Uh, we have a new image and the image is stored in the registry. Now you have latest, for example, to pinpoint to the latest image, but you have usually uh, target releases. <clears throat> On the other end, you have the operator that can apply the image um, in the context, for example, of Kubernetes um, with the system upgrade controller directly, or can also use um, continuous integration um, and delivery system, uh, for example, uh, Fleet, Argo, Flux, uh, and Tecton can uh, can do that. So you can have, for example, um, Fleet being configured uh, to watch to a specific um, GitHub repository that will contain um, our um, manifest for the system upgrade controller, which actually drives the, the, the upgrades of our node in the cluster. Again, yeah, and here um, I just wanted to underline how easy and somebody we forget to uh, to work with images. So um, they can be easily mutated with uh, via Docker file. So if you have something which is already published at, uh, at some version, I can always build another version of it which is based on top of that. So applying hot fixes uh, become uh, extremely uh, cheap and easy. Um, you can disable immutability uh, in CS Toolkit, so you can use that as a mechanism for um, troubleshooting. So you have the recovery partition to be able to reset state and up, uh, perform also upgrades if, if needed. And you see here um, the usual commands that you uh, you run uh, a container um, apply. So you docker run um, an image, uh, you could docker commit and docker push it. 
to, to a registry. And then on, on the other end, um, I could do also a manual upgrade in that case um, and run CS upgrade pointing to the, that image. So you have also a way to do um, trigger um, upgrades manually without Kubernetes. You, you are not left um, if you don't have uh, Kubernetes integration. So now I wanted to show you uh, what I have um, here. I to share my screen. All right, so um, should be able to see um, a Ranger web UI. Um, so I have um, set up um, here with few, a bunch of nodes, um, have uh, development, local, production, and test cluster. So if you are not familiar with uh, Ranger, um, it is um, capable of doing uh, multi-cluster um, management. So you can import multiple Kubernetes clusters to it, and you have also a way to, in, uh, to, to run uh, continuous delivery uh, plans to it with uh, the integration with fleet. Okay, now this is uh, not looking good at this moment, but um, what, what, um, what, what I wanted to, to show you is you can trigger, um, you can trigger uh, CI um, continuous delivery uh, actions with it uh, and upgrade um, the single node cluster element. So I'm not going to do it now, trigger it now because it takes um, several times so I have a, um, a small recording showing, uh, showing you the upgrade kicking and uh, being propagated to the nodes. Um, so what I wanted just to show you here um, is I have, for example, my production cluster um, with some nodes um, here. And this is all our all nodes um, that are running a derivative that I have created um, for this purpose. So you can also find it and find it on GitHub. Um, it, it is just for playing it around. So um, you can see uh, that everything is uh, mostly um, a Docker file uh, if you are going to, to browse it. So um, you can see here the, the standard um, syntax of Docker. So we would just take some uh, base image you install some packages with zipper, we apply the framework um, plus some other packages that I wanted to apply here, install some custom other uh, software as well, and then um, setting some static bits like um, the, the version uh, of my uh, derivative or um, what is the name of it. And that's it. So th this is how I declare um, uh, my bootable image. Um, at that point, um, I have the CI, which is just pushing uh, the image. And um, I have used the toolkit to create uh, the ISO, although I could have just used the, um, the vanilla image from COS uh, to drive the de deployment. So the, the VMs here um, are actually um, bootstrapped with the CS vanilla images, which are fitted into the, the container image. So uh, during bootstrap, um, you just provide um, to, uh, to the cloud in it, the container image that you, you want to, to boot. Um, and then you have all the, um, the containers here running, for example, this is my derivative version five. So you will see um, soon, uh, we'll play the video, uh, how this will, will change uh, very easily. <laughs> when when I, I will, uh, I will, um, change the repo config file. So um, my CI, uh, which is currently uh, fleet configured to, to Kubernetes cluster, it is listening, um, it's watching actively to this other repository, which is configured to have the fleet configuration. So it is uh, a way to describe um, um, applying a deployment, um, set a deployment manifest to, to the Kubernetes cluster. And when I change this, it will automatically trigger um, um, the upgrade. So we have all the mechanisms <clears throat> living um, in GitHub. I try to play it very fast. So the video is also um, speeded up. Um, so here uh, you can see on the on the bottom part um, the the list of nodes. Um, I couldn't zoom it more because I wanted to show you all the information, so it couldn't fit it very easily. Uh, you can see the OS image here at version um, C3 OS 2, which is um, at the end of it, 
and the kernel version. So um, by by one by one, the node now will start upgrading, and we can start to see that on the left. Uh, if you look on the status uh, column, uh, which are currently the worker number three is uh, scheduling um, and it's already upgrading. Um, every node will start to to roll the the upgrade. What, what is actually happening? Um, we have a pod which is running uh, in the cluster. Uh, running in the node that is targeted to do the upgrade, um, which pulls the, the, the image and it will reconstruct the image over the host. So um, the pooling aspect is driven by Kubernetes. So uh, that lets you um, have that part um, completely ended, for example, by mission controls and everything else then it's handled by the toolkit. So the, the, the actual job of upgrading, it's happening there. And yeah, as you can see um, now, one by one, the node will start to change. So you see now the worker three um, has been upgraded to version five, and you see also there is a new kernel version with it. So you have um, 27 here by default, and it was 24. Now I'm going to to fast a little bit faster. You see now uh, we have almost all the node version 27 of the kernel and new um, Docker image uh, version two as well. And I will stop sharing because I took already too much time and I didn't left any for Q and A. So thanks uh, first for watching. Um, those are the links that um, for the pro of the project. Um, we have also worked hardly on the documentation, so um, feel free uh, to to have a look at the getting started section. There are a um, lot of examples on how to build your derivative, and that's it now. So we have a couple of questions on the chat. Um, I talked to Richard and he is willing to read them out on his own. Yep, um, I'll start in a completely different order than I asked him in too. Um, are rollbacks with Element really possible when you need them? Like, because if you've got an image that's, you know, it's booting, it's connecting to your Kubernetes cluster, you know, all that, you know, the networking's working, all that stuff's fine. You know what's left that could possibly be wrong. Um, you know, so you know, I'm kind of thinking like compare it to let's say SLE or microOS. You know, what's the equivalent of um, you know booting into a read-only snapshot in Grub when it's broken, or what's an equivalent of like health checker in microOS automatically rolling back for when you've actually got a broken image, so you can't connect to your cloud anymore, so you can't use your cloud to roll back. In the elemental case, that, that's uh, where the recovery machine, um, the recovery system uh, triggers. Um, so you can have the derivative uh, tweaking that aspect very well defined to to cover those those scenarios. Because when you do upgrades, it's happening just on the active partition. So if everything fails, it goes into the passive automatically, and otherwise it goes back into recovery. So the recovery then it's up to you because you can have a recovery, a special recovery, uh, which is another image which is acting in a uh, different way. So you can um, customize that aspect a lot um, in the elemental context. Cool. Okay. Um, next question. You described USR being read only and you described mm -hmm. root as immutable. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, that reads as root is immutable and USR is something which could be turned to be read write. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes. Doesn't that make like no sense at all when you consider almost every distribution is either putting all of their binaries in user or moving all their binaries to user? So the very thing you want to be immutable is the very thing you've made read writable. No, it is just a configuration aspect because you don't need to be uh, too much uh, hard on the immutability because you you might have a different, uh, completely different layout, right, on on the derivative. So that's the why um, we are disagnostic on that aspect, and we can play well with Alpine or all the distro because you can um, do uh, tweak the immutability aspect as much as you like. So you can tell, okay, that part is not immutable, or it is ephemeral, or it is half immutable, and I will store all the de delta in the, 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 the persistent space, which is actually meant to persist across reboots. So you have <clears throat> a pretty tiny amount um, of effort to, to put into changing the layout, because if you don't need uh, immutability on USR, and you are using the toolkit to build an image which actually is not immutable, you can do that. That's the full point of it. So you are free 
uh, on that aspect. Okay. Um, last question, and then we're going to have dive in. Um, in my experience, cloud init is like super problematic, especially like running modules and messing with config when you don't want it to. Like you literally do not define it in your cloud init config, and cloud init just goes and does it anyway. This is why in micro OS and Slim Micro, we find ourselves using Ignition for that kind of role. Mm -hmm. um, why choose cloud init over Ignition? Well, it is de facto standard for that um, cloud in it and making it around not having too many configuration files. Um, it was the, the the clear point. So you have to stick to just one uh, way to, to configure things. And you go from that from the beginning, which is like from um, a simple deployment on OpenStack or um, whatever um, provider supports cloud in it, right? So you can just stub your cloud in it file but at that point, you won't, don't want to have yet another configuration thing on top of that. So we choose uh, the cloud init to just augment that. And in the same way, you can use the cloud init to, um, to perform customization also on the derivative side. So the, the good uh, aspect of that um, design choice is you stick to one thing only, and it will persist across everything. Um, that's, that's why uh, we have put it in that way. So we have the cloud init. Uh, standard version, which is very simple uh, to work with. Um, and we just map that to a very specific part uh, of our ecosystem because it's widely bigger. So we, you can run cloud in it in very different contexts. So um, that, that's why um, we have chosen that. Okay, we have two other questions on the chat. One from Vincent. When will COS be really renamed to Elemental, especially the GitHub repo and documentation? Bonus question, is there an upcoming announcement about Elemental? I cannot really reply on that, but um, uh, you should see COS toolkit as part of Elemental, uh, basically. So Elemental, it will be wider and it will include more tools. So CS toolkit is the, the basic uh, building block of it. I would say. Okay, and we have a question from Anton. What are crossing points of Elemental and BCI? I really cannot um, reply that. The, the thing uh, you should keep in mind is you can use the BCI artifacts to create your element. Uh, so that's the crossing point. So you don't need, um, uh, they, they are very in conjunction together. So you can um, literally use whatever image as a source, so that, that's a valid, uh, completely valid use case. Okay, given that we are over time, I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks a lot.